Okay, so I want to talk in this video about women in physics. Contentious subject, especially if, as we were discussing the other day, you're going to make a point that doesn't go along with the narrative, which is what I'm going to do here. I know there'll be some people in the first couple of minutes of this video who will write me off as a sexist and then not bother listening actually to what the arguments are. If you are one of those people, please don't. Watch the rest of the video and then if you want to write me off as a sexist, that's absolutely fine. You may do so. Feel free to do so. What I want to do right from the word go is to just outline what I'm going to do in this video. First I'm going to give you a little bit of an opening piece just to outline what it's about and just to tell you some of the things that this video is not about. Then I'm going to give you the statistics for the United Kingdom so it frames it in some kind of context, puts physics in relation to other sciences, in relation to education generally so you can see what it is I'm talking about and then I'm going to tell you why I think this whole business is a singular waste of time, why physics doesn't benefit from trying to get more women into physics and why women don't benefit from trying to get them to go into physics rather than doing what they would be doing otherwise. That's what I aim to do. Okay, so let's make a little bit of a start on this. So what I'm not talking about, right off the bat, I'm not talking about women physicists, female physicists, how they're treated within their field. I'm talking about this push, trying to chase the numbers, trying to get more women onto physics, undergraduate and postgraduate courses because we're not happy we're looking at the numbers and we're not happy. Now if you noted the title of this video what you will have noted quite unusually for me is that there's very much a nailing of the flag to the mast exercise going on and that is because this is a subject that I'm not unfamiliar with. I am aware of what the arguments are on each side here and what I usually like to do when I make a video. I have my own biases, prejudices, perspectives and outlooks and opinions, but what I try and do is to at least outline the arguments on each side and show there is some balance of arguments, that both sides have at least some arguments of merit. I have to say this is one of those rare occasions where on one side I can't really see any decent arguments at all. All I can see is motivations. I can see emotional pulls, but I can't see motivations. Maybe one thing I could do was just to outline those emotional pulls. One of them is framing it in the historical context. And boy, there's an historical context of underrepresentation of women in science, a tragic underrepresentation of women in science. This whole wellspring, untapped wellspring of intelligence intelligence in 50% of the population which was never taken advantage of for society and of course that includes tragic individual stories of young women growing up interested in some of these things with with inquiring minds and not having the opportunity to go to university and pursue the disciplines that they would like to pursue to pursue their passions within the fields of science if that's where their passions lay that is not the situation today as you will see when I show you the statistics. The second is simply the fact that people are just looking at the raw numbers and thinking, well, there's something wrong. These numbers are not reflecting society. There is an underrepresentation. And being cynical, it's an underrepresentation in the direction that we actually give a shit about. So we need to do something about it. That, those are the emotional motivations, but they're not cogent arguments as to why we should try and get women into physics. The whole business of this women in physics is a subset of women in science, which is a subset of women in STEM. And so I ought to make a comment on that, which is the first comment would be that whenever you hear the arguments about women in science, Really, nowadays, what you're talking about is women in physics, because effectively, that's what it boils down to, as I will demonstrate when I show you the statistics. That's really the fighting ground. Women in science just makes it sound like a bigger issue than it actually is, quite frankly. The women in STEM includes other things, and I, I, I want to make it quite clear that the comments I'm making here don't, don't spread to all issues regarding women in STEM because there are some situations in which we could actually all benefit from more women in STEM, actually. As a Western industrialised society, you can ha never have enough engineers, quite frankly. And it is true that if we could convince more women 
to not be interested in taking a drama degree, a media studies degree, a fine art degree or a social studies degree and instead take an engineering degree. If we could really do that trick and make them interested in those things, then that would be for the benefit of society, I would suggest. And the second thing is that when you look across the whole sphere of STEM, not in terms of people doing courses, but in terms of out there in the world of work, you will find that women are woefully underrepresented. Only about 15% of the workforce in those fields uh, are women. Uh, but be, be aware that none of that has got to do with the proportions of people doing physics courses. Physics being a course where a lot of people that do the courses don't even remain in related fields anyway. They're going away and teaching physics. They're going away in the education sector or they're going away if they get a particularly good degree and working in the city of London. Right? What we're talking about by and large is the impact of engineering and men dominating engineering. We're talking about fields like construction. We're talking about fields like mining we're talking about the huge field of manufacturing that is driving these statistics on the basis of engineers and and the gross preponderance uh, of, of male engineers it's nothing to do with women taking physics courses it's nothing really to do with the pure sciences whatsoever okay so i hope that throws that into some kind of context so what i ought to go on and do now before I start looking uh, at the situation of whether women could benefit physics or whether it's to the benefit of, w of women for, to push them into physics, let's just have a little look at the stats. So let's start off with this because frankly this is the nice little graphic and it gives you an overview. Subject of study by level and gender, 2013-14. The year isn't important, that was just the year that the Times, who, who produced a lot of, of material, support material for higher education, also an analytical material, produced this particularly nice graph. So let's go with that. And what we're looking at, we're looking at 100% of, of the student population at British universities and breaking it down into female undergraduates, female postgraduates, male undergraduates and male post graduates in these broad subject areas and what you can see is we're going from the subject area that's most dominated by female students through to the subject area that's most dominated by male students and what you can see is all these ones at the top down to medicine and dentistry are dominated by female students then you have a couple of categories historical and philosophical uh, uh, subjects, business and administrative, where it's very much in the balance. And then we have these, these five categories at the bottom that are dominated by male students. Okay, so the question is then, in terms of a society, which are the ones that we're getting really antsy about? Which are the ones we're really bothered about where we feel we've got to, we've got to address the statistical asymmetry? Well, it's four of these five categories at the bottom. It's the physical sciences, the mathematical sciences, computer science and engineering. Those are the ones where we view the asymmetry and regard it as somewhat abhorrent. How can we allow these asymmetries to stand? And we do this under the umbrella term of STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. Now, you have to bear in mind that technically STEM also includes subjects allied to medicine, also includes veterinary science and also includes the biological science and also includes medicine and dentistry. But we kind of forget about those. We disregard those because, frankly, the asymmetry is, is not in the direction that fits the narrative. So when we talk about representation in STEM, really what we're talking about is these particular ones. And let's just kind of forget about that those other ones exist, frankly. And I know it sounds like I'm being a bit cynical there, but I'm afraid that's just the way that it's portrayed uh, in the media. So then moving on to this graphic, which is a little bit more boring, but I want to give you some appreciation of the numbers. And I'm going to have to read some of these numbers out because I know some people just listen on their headphones uh, rather than actually watching the video. But I want to give you a scale of the numbers so you can appreciate, you can set physics and physics students into a bigger context of education generally in terms of pure science subjects generally, in terms of science subject areas generally. Okay, so you can see how this is being sold and what the reality is. The reality is that at the undergraduate level, there are 890,000 female students at British universities versus only 707,000 male students. Women are wiping the floor with men nowadays. And this is a gap that is growing year on year on year. And as you can see, as you probably expected, it is non-science subject areas that are mainly accounting for it. 
521,000 female students to 333,000 male students. I'm sure that didn't shock you, but what might shock you is when you look at the figure for what constitutes science subject areas, despite the narrative which we're being sold all the time, there are as many female students as male students, 368,000 versus 373,000, almost neck and neck at the first degree level. And I'm not hiding anything by only showing you first degree level. If I show you if I include postgrad students as well, you'll see now there are more female students than male subjects in science subject areas. 548,000 female students versus only 515,000 male students. Okay, we'll go back to the first degree figures, but you can see that that doesn't make things better, including postgrads, it just makes it worse. I just want to read out some, some key categories here that I think are really important. We're talking about the physical sciences, of course, including physics, 30,000 females to 43,000 males. So these are the discrepancies that we're interested in that we're focused on here. But this isn't the driving force in science subject areas. The driving force in science subject areas are really computer science and engineering favoring men, 12,000 to 67,000 and 18,000 to 96,000 female to males. Uh, and then at the other, st at the other extent, Subject allied to medicine, which of course includes nursing, 135,000 females to 33,000 males, balancing those engineers out, and biological sciences, 111,000 to 66,000. Important point here is to note then, A, that the biological sciences, are just like the sort of mirror image of the physical sciences in that they favour female uh, students rather than male students, but the second thing to notice is just what a bigger subject area it is, right? It blows the physical sciences out the water. 178 undergrads studying the biological sciences versus only 73 undergrads studying the physical sciences. And yet, which is the bit we're interested in? Well, it's the physical sciences, obviously, because that's where female students are underrepresented. I'd also just like to point out while we're on this page, medicine and dentistry, 25,000 female students versus only 19,000 male students. And law, 43,000 female students versus 24,000 male students. And education, 48,000 female students versus only 7,000 male students. Why am I pointing those out? Well, you'll see a little bit later in the video. Just let me flick over to principal subject because there's just a couple of little sort of flagship subjects that I want to show you here. The first would be the three, I suppose what we regard as the three big sciences, biology, chemistry and physics. You can see there explicitly in, in the field of biology, 15,000 female students versus just 10,000 male students. So female students are dominating there. If we look down at chemistry here, F1, as it's listed here, 8,000 female students to 11,000 male students, a predomination of male students there, but that is a gap that's growing and is predicted that that could close pretty much entirely over the next decade. Physics, this is the gap that, that we're really, that's always being talked about, 4,000 female students versus 13,500 male students. But I also just want to draw your attention while we're on here, allied to biology, just these two fields here, Genetics, 1,150 female students to 700 male students. Microbiology, 1,400 female students to 1,000 male students. Female students dominating in these two cutting edge fields of genetics and microbiology. I thought that was really interesting there. Couple of other flagship subjects that I haven't mentioned. I've mentioned law and education, but psychology, 63,000 female students to only 14,000 male students. And finally, if we go right towards the bottom of the list, uh, where are we here? Uh, philosophy, equal numbers. This is traditionally a big male bastion. Actually, 100 more female students, 5,435 female students. 5,355 male students in the balance, as many women doing philosophy as men. Okay, that gives you an idea of the numbers. Okay, so those are the statistics. Dry as fuck. I apologise for that, but I hope you can see why I needed to do that. I needed to show you that this business, this push for women in physics is not some test case that's indicative of an asymmetry, of an underrepresentation of women across the sphere of higher education. 
In fact, nothing could be further from the truth across the sphere of higher education. It is women, it is female students who are dominating and that gap is growing year on year on year. But neither even is it indicative of an underrepresentation of women in science subject areas, despite the way that this is portrayed by those who are championing women in STEM, despite the way that this is portrayed in the media, there are as many female students in science subject areas at British universities as there are male students in those science subject areas. And neither is it indicative that, yes, there are more women than men in universities, uh, but they're all doing drama and media studies and social studies and fine art and things such as that. You can see that that is not the case. In subjects, real subjects, cutting-edge subjects like microbiology and genetics, women are dominating. In the biological sciences, women are dominating. In subjects such as education, such as law, such as medicine, that leads to professional career paths where you are liable to earn more money on average than you are as a physicist, women are dominating and that's a really really important point to get across and something that i refer to a little bit later in the video okay so who is supposed to benefit from more women taking physics courses it seems to me there are two possibilities one is that physics benefits and the second is that women benefit i want to consider each of those in turn. So let's start off by considering whether physics itself benefits from having more women in physics. So the first argument that's often made is that it will be in some way beneficial to physics itself to have more women involved in physics, or allied to that, I suppose, maybe something I'll just tackle first, is that it's in some way beneficial to society if we could get women more invested, more interested, and more involved in physics. I say I'll tackle that first because you will note I made an argument right at the beginning of the video that it might be beneficial if we could get more women interested in engineering if we could manage to pull off that trick no did i explicitly said rather than subjects such as social studies drama fine art um media studies i didn't mention subjects such as the biological sciences such as medicine such as education but if we could make that particular pillage of, of those interests with, with engineering then that would be a benefit why because in a west industrialized society we could always do with more engineers in fact even in most third world countries they're crying out for more engineers which is why in those countries there are so many more women that are doing engineering subjects because that's just the thing to do if you want to have a career get involved in engineering you cannot make the same case with physics and one of the key things about physics what is evidenced by that is the sheer number of engineers with training up versus physicists but also it's quite easy to go straight from an engineering degree into a subject, into a, into a career that is directly related to that. Whereas that's not always the case with physics and people go into subjects that are not directly related to physics. I mentioned, did I not, that if you've got a really good first class degree in physics from a top university, you might be headhunted by the City of London to get into the banking sector. Now that isn't because they need your insight into cosmology or into quantum mechanics. It's because what you've done is you've managed to demonstrate that you have the intellectual levels and also the kinds of skills that they need that are transferable into the specific subject areas that are important. It isn't your particular physics knowledge that's important. That's just indicative that you have the qualities that they need. So I don't believe that getting more women in physics and then having a, 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 a greater number of physics students is what's going to happen. What we're talking about is having roughly the same number of physics students but a greater proportion of them being women, which is a very, very different thing. But then we come on to then, is it beneficial to physics itself? And we get this usual mantra, don't we, that diversity is always beneficial, right? It's just the way it is. We don't need to evidence it. We don't need to provide anything. And of course, there are studies that have shown that in some spheres, diversity has been beneficial. But does that mean in every sphere? diversity is beneficial does that mean in physics that diversity is beneficial i think it's a much much harder case to make frankly if you're talking about politics 
if you're talking in real life day-to-day -day occupations, if you're talking about a human resources department, if you're talking at university, ironically, about a subject like social studies, which doesn't seem to care that much about getting uh, the right gender balance and doesn't actually care about getting the right political balance, ironically, as Jonathan Haidt has demonstrated, the political balance in the social sciences has got worse and worse and worse decade upon decade from about a four to one left to right balance through to about a 20 to one left to right balance. That's ironic, but you could see within those spheres, right, when it impacts upon people's everyday lives and when it relies upon our lived experience and understanding of both our everyday life and everybody else's and how we've interacted with them, that having a 50-50 mix, if you've got 100 people going to be involved in that, if you had 50 men and 50 women, you could understand why that would maybe be a better sample and would be of some benefit rather than having 100 men and no women or 100 women and no men. But is the same really true of physics, I've got to say? Is lived experience really going to inform you uh, if you're studying the subject of quantum chromodynamics? Is your Western femininity really going to be of benefit if you're studying early universe cosmology? That's a bigger sell, I'm afraid. I, I'm afraid I don't really buy that one. These are very, very esoteric subjects that are so far removed from our everyday experience. In fact, in many cases, utterly counterintuitive so that you've pretty much just got to accept that is how they are because it doesn't even make any sense. They just boggle our brains, right? None of that lived experience, Western femininity stuff, it doesn't really have any traction in those fields, uh, in those fields I propose. So what are we left with? Well, ironically, what we're left with is to assert something that in any other circumstance, or if you were to assert it out loud, would get you a figurative slap around the face from the nearest feminist, which, which is to suggest some form of gender essentialism, that there are effectively women's ways of knowing and women's ways of being that are unique to women, that if you just have a group of male physicists, they won't be able to bring this these ways of thinking to the table. Um, and so you need women to bring these things on board. As I say, you'd be called out loud as a filthy gender essentialist if you were to assert these things. And nobody is asserting this, right? Nobody is saying this is why we need more diversity in physics. All they're saying is we benefit from more diversity in physics. But when you winnow it down and take away that part of the lived experience that really doesn't have any any traction in the field of physics, this is what you're left with, that women just think and know in different ways and that that's going to help us to solve these problems, okay? I don't buy that. I do buy that statistically there are differences between men and women, but I don't believe there are uniquely women's ways of thinking about things and men's ways of thinking about things. And it, it is ironic beyond belief that effectively this is what they are appealing to when they're appealing to this, and yet this is something that they cannot stand, a notion that they cannot stand. Okay, so that deals with that, and that's why I disregard this idea that it's to the benefit of physics. I don't think, given the nature of physics, that it's going to make the damnedest bit of difference, but perhaps it's to the benefit of, of the women themselves. So this is the part that I find the most interesting. This understanding that individual women will benefit. If only we can convince more, more girls, more young women uh, to take physics courses and become physicists, that they will be happier or they will achieve more in some way than they would have done if they'd done whatever they would have done if we hadn't convinced them to take physics courses and become physicists. And I'm really, really not convinced by that. To me, it is an anachronistic argument. It is an argument out of time. It's an argument from the past. And you can understand it. If you go back to that context of the past, you can understand the mode of thinking. It was absolutely true. If you go back to when I was born, 1972, and prior to that, 
We had a situation where, quite honestly, professions and careers were mainly for men. For those subjects and areas that women did go into, such as education, it was largely seen as something that you did up until the point where you got married, or at least only up until the point where you had children, hence why uh, uh, school teachers, female school teachers were called Miss. And at that point, you abandoned that and became a housewife. And there is something kind of tragic to that, I think, that you can have women with large intellectual capacities, with all the gifts and with the desire to have a career and a profession and to see how far they can push themselves, but being hamstrung by society and being told, no, that's not for you as a woman, that is for somebody as a man, it's not really relevant to you. I think we've moved beyond that. I think the university numbers I've shown you have moved beyond that. And the result of that, is that you can't frame it in that old, outdated paradigm. If we're encouraging girls to take physics courses and be physicists, they're not doing that instead of being housewives, right? Or instead of being secretaries or instead of being cleaners. They're doing that instead of doing philosophy courses, instead of doing biology courses, instead of doing psychology courses, instead of doing medicine courses, instead of doing law courses, instead of taking the biological sciences. They're becoming physicists instead of becoming legal advocates, instead of becoming doctors and saving people's lives, instead of becoming biologists, instead of becoming teachers and having a full career in the teaching profession and maybe getting to be a deputy or a head teacher. Right? It's a very, very different situation we're talking. We're effectively stealing those women from other occupations that are very, very much on the same level, both in terms of how we view them, but also in terms of the potential earnings and the potential progression that we could get. So I think this is a really, really important point here because it really isn't certain to me who we are hoping is going to benefit from this. And I think it calls into question whose interests we're actually serving here, that maybe rather than serving the interests of girls, we're serving our own vanities, effectively. But let me try and give you a little bit of a not necessarily a deeper insight into the issues, it might be, but certainly a deeper insight into what I think is going on here, which is if you look at this from a social science perspective, the fear is, is that girls, as in all of us, are being, are being uh, funneled down certain paths by society and culture. And for whatever reason, girls are just, just unable to be able to, to counter it when it comes to science. And so society is saying girls science isn't for you don't get involved in science and so girls aren't going into science now on the face of it that's bunk it's just crap and you can see why because I've shown you the statistics because there are areas of science bigger areas of science than physics the biological sciences where girls are dominating. It isn't that they're going into science, they're going into science in very, very large numbers. It's only in this field of physics that they're not going into it. So think about what's being claimed here as, an, as a course of action, as a remedial course of action, is that the fear is, is that society and culture is dissuading girls from doing something, right? And that's a bad thing because it means that they may not be following their passions, right? And so what the claim is, is that we need to provide some kind of corrective measure. So we are determinedly, specifically, explicitly going to start pushing girls towards physics, selling physics to girls. We're going to determinedly, explicitly start doing the very thing that we are concerned about, right? For what good? Surely we are running the risk of doing for certain, the very thing that may have been happening anyway. And what do we think is going to happen here? What conceivable grounds do we have for thinking that, that, that girls are going to be happier as physicists than they were as biologists? For thinking if only some of these young women that take biology and become biologists would take physics and become physicists, they'd only 
Well, what would they be? Would they be happier? I don't see any grounds for thinking so. It just seems for me that the measures that we're talking about here, the measures that we would have to take to start providing this, uh, to, to dealing with this asymmetry in physics, are going to guarantee we do the kinds of things that we're scared that may be happening. And it isn't going to benefit girls at all because we're not taking the secretaries anymore. We're not taking the cleaners and the housewives we're taking girls that are going into these other very, very highbrow subjects such as law, such as medicine, such as the biological sciences and just dragging some of them into physics. The only good that it seems to me that we're achieving is a statistical good. And we're not doing it for the benefit of the girls. We're not doing it for the benefit of society. We're not doing it for the benefit of uh, physics we're doing it for our own vanity we're doing it for our own benefit because it will make us feel a little bit happier about the statistics we're actually not showing any concern whatsoever for individuals we're taking this kind of myopic viewpoint that if the stats balance then somehow that must be indicative of happy individuals and if they don't that must be indicative that something is wrong and individuals would be uh, must be less happy you could take 5000 uh, girls who are picking their university subjects right and say no you're not doing those subjects you're going to do a physics course whether you like it or not and in the statistics that would all look fantastic oh look how much better things are look at these statistics but what it wouldn't show is that you've now got 5,000 fantastically unhappy individuals. The statistics don't show you anything whatsoever in terms of the individuals and whether those individuals are happy or whether they're following their passions. All it shows you is whether statistics look nice. And I'm afraid that's effectively what it boils down to. We're placing the statistics not only above personal happiness, but also above common sense. It's almost as if we don't know when to stop, right? We don't know when the fights that needed to be fought have been won, and when we can move on perhaps to some of the fights that maybe still need to be fought, even in the field of STEM. No, no, we have to get them all right. We have to, we just cannot stop until every single subject has at least 50% women in it because if it doesn't then there must be some unhappy women out there somewhere some women who would be achieving more if only we could tease them away from the thing they've gone into into this thing that we would like them to go into this isn't helping anybody folks and the and the and the group that it isn't potentially helping most of all is going to be women okay interested to know what you think i'm sure some people will have some responses for that particularly interested if you can contend with what I said, that there aren't any really rational, cogent arguments as to why we should be doing this. 40 years ago, yes. Now, no. Interested to know about that. Okay, in lieu of that, thank you for watching. Bye for now. Just wanted to add, I very, very rarely do this. I very rarely give a Patreon push on my channel other than a little comment, but it's getting harder and harder on YouTube really you're getting a strange situation advertising is getting it's it's negligible really for channels such as mine patreon is becoming as you would expect i suppose in a, in a capitalist system and i am a capitalist so i've got no problem with that but it is getting into a situation where fewer and fewer people are getting more and more of the resources really and it's kind of for me it's a little bit odd because it's not something where you're buying a product it's something where you're sponsoring channels presumably to try and make sure that those channels remain funded and keep doing what they're doing and some of these channels now are getting absolutely astronomical amounts and I'm not really sure what that extra couple of dollars a month adds on to that and why people feel the motivation uh, to fund those channels rather than other channels. But if my channel or other channels like mine that generally present less polarised material, that try and show a little bit of both sides and flesh out their arguments, if you appreciate that, then please support it right because it is getting harder my support on patreon has drifted down over the last seven or eight months and, and i don't think i'm doing anything worse and i don't think i'm any less supported on youtube it's just that it seems to be the loudest brashest most polarized voices that always seem to get the greatest amount of support and this kind of thing does take quite a bit of time. I want to be able to keep doing this rather than having to do a, a second job that means that I can't sit on my ass and drink coffee and talk to you good people. Uh, I'd like to keep doing that because this is my passion. Um, and if you'd like to help support me do that, then 
that would very very much be appreciated okay little little patron nag over take care